Do you like books? I mean, really, really like books? Then you're in the right place. Each week, your host, Sam Hankin, interviews the best of today's top-selling authors and the up-and-coming superstars of modern literature. This is The Avid Reader. Here is your host, Sam Hankin. Hi, everyone. Thanks, as always, for joining us here on The Avid Reader, brought to you by my bookshop, Wellington Square Bookshop, here in Exeter, Pennsylvania. Our guest today is Kimberly Harrington, author of But You Seem So Happy, A Marriage in Pieces and Bits, published by Harper Perennial, and it'll be released in uh, just a week, less than a week. Um, Kimberly is the author of Amateur Hour, Motherhood in Essays and Swear Words, kind of a theme in terms of subtitles. Uh, she does a lot with McSweeney's, which is like my favorite thing ever. I sound like a kid. Um, her work has appeared in the New Yorker, the New York Times, and she does tons of copywriting for every major brand in the world, from Acura to Whole Foods. You can check out the list on her website, which is Honey Stay, Stay Super. Honey Stay Super, one word. And it says in her biography that she will one day live alone again, swear to God, which is actually a good lead in for the book. So, but you seem so happy. I remember hearing that hundreds of times during both of my divorces for good or for bad. So Kimberly is as cynical about the term conscious up uncoupling as me, but some folks may think that this is what this book about is about. It's not, I don't think. I guess leave that to Gwyneth Paltrow. So with that, welcome Kimberly, and thanks a lot for what will be putting up with me. <laughs> thanks for having me. So you have two bleeding dogs in this book. I don't think I've ever read a book with it, two bleeding dogs. <laughs> I mean, it just seems odd. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. I hadn't thought of that. Maybe that's some subtext there. Yeah, who knows? Um, it's funny. You know, there's so many things in this book, as I was just saying to you before, that remind me of my divorces, especially the things that people say to you, what caused it, whose fault is it? And I remember in my second one, if I had to distill it into one thing, it was because I wasn't emptying the dishwasher. Right. You right. know, it's just like, it's like the straw that broke the camel's back kind of thing. It's the death by a thousand cuts. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and I think, and I do think that's pretty common. I think that's, uh, it doesn't get a lot of attention. You know, it's not very sexy. It's not very, uh, it doesn't feel gossip. So those kind of, breakups or separations or divorces just don't get that that kind of attention I think that's just those are way more common than the really uh scandalous divorces you know it's funny you talk about it in the very beginning of the book and I'm always obsessed with covers and epigraphs and stuff because I own a bookstore and um I always say this but um people say you can't judge a book by its cover but every single person who comes in here does exactly that and um one of my uh, employees just came in and she goes, this is such a cool cover. It looks like it's from the 50s. And I said, yeah, that's exactly the way it's supposed to be because this is the way people were happy back then. Oh, this is because it's a virtual background, which I hate because right, I'm, right. I'm moving and everything is like a mess <laughs> behind me. Um, can you hold up a copy of the book? Yeah, right here. I yeah, thought I had a, it turned around. Yeah, cause, so it's kind of like... Uh, at home with Dick and Jane or something like that. Yeah, and it's a thought, great, great cover. Oh yeah, it is. I was wondering whether you vetted it or you came up with it or. I did not come up with it. I had, uh, I worked in design my entire career. So I, I had, uh, I had some Pinterest boards for sure. <laughs> I tried to influence it as, mu as much as I could, but obviously authors don't have a ton of input into the cover, but I really appreciate that my editor and my team really heard me how important design is to the covers of my books. And the designer, uh, Jen, I, I'm probably gonna butcher the, the pronunciation of her last name. I hope I don't, Hewer. She did such an incredible job that uh, when I saw it, you know, there was one option when I saw it. And again, I work in design, I'm, I'm pretty choosy. And when I saw it, I was like, yep, Yep, that works. <laughs> That's amazing. And it, it's gotten such great feedback. I am also a very much judging books by their cover kind of person. Yeah. And the reason why publishers do it, and not authors, is because they want to sell the book. Yeah. You know? Right. Right. Uh, right. 
and, and that's something you say in the beginning of the book. It's like, and this is so true here. You know, when you wrote the book on motherhood, you say women are interested, but then guys go, uh, okay. And then guys come in if they see a cover that's about with a woman on it with half of her head cut off or the girl who fell from yes. something. Right. Uh, and, uh, but this cover, I think appeals to a lot of people. I hope it does. It'll be really interesting. You know, I think because the first book was on motherhood, I think this is naturally drawing in some of those readers who, who found me through that first book. And, uh, you know, I think we should be reading books by all sorts of people, not just the people who are like us. So I really, I really hope it brings more men into the fold than the first book, um, because it's really about it's about marriage. You know, it's certainly my point of view. There are two paths through the book. That's my own personal experience, but then there's the conceptual pathway about marriage. And I, I really hope um, men will find this book. Yeah, it's very true when you do your uh, Harry and Sally and when you do your, basically your, your marriage contract of sorts. Right. And then your hypothetical, here's what's gonna happen. Do you really right. think this is a good idea? Um, and that's in the beginning you talk about like maybe there's a little bit of a yuck factor when you say you're writing a book oh, of course oh yes please let me talk about that a little bit more because it's it's very interesting to have written that preface and to you know i kind of noticed this really stark difference in how people interacted with me through the process of both books so when i worked on my first book and of course it's the first book so i think it was a little different because people are like how's the book going and When's it going to be out? And I've received almost no questions about the second book. <laughs> so that's really what inspired the preface because I'm like, wow, I'm, I'm not imagining this. You know, no one wants to know what's going on with this book. I, and I think part of it is the people in your circle don't know what's in the book with this sort of topic. So they're very wary, justifiably so. But now that I'm on the promo side of it, the book's done. Now that I'm on the promo side of it, it, it's happening all over again. I, I've been really shocked how uh, how wary people are of it. And I was just like, wait a minute, wasn't divorce trending through the whole pandemic? Like, <laughs> well, it's, it's you know, so funny it, because you know, I feel like I I just went to a wedding last week, and I, I was thinking I should. It's my cousin's daughter, and so I gave him money. I also give him a lava lamp. Because I give everyone a lava lamp for their wedding because I figure that if they don't like it, I don't really want to deal with them anymore. <laughs> but I even know I've done it so often that I just call lava lamp directly. <laughs> so anyway, so I'm thinking I should cut down on the amount of money that I give people for their marriages because 40% of them are going to end. It's like, why am I doing this? And it's like, I think a lot of people who look at your book or listen to what you're saying, they're kind of on a tipping point. So it's like a trigger, it's like a trigger yeah. for a trigger warning. Yeah, I think, uh, you it's know, like I, I said in the preface, it's, it's sort of people treat divorce as contagious and the reactions that people give by and large are about them. They're not about, I mean, I think this is true throughout life that the way we react to someone else's news, whether it's, whether it's good news or what we perceive as bad news, is really about us most of the time. It's really not about the people. And so I think it's similar in that, like, if you're in a very sketchy place and you read something that's going to tip you over the edge, like, or you're afraid it's going to tip you over the edge, where really, to me, this book is about examining marriage and not necessarily saying it's dumb, but it's like, we don't, we don't reflect on it. We all kind of run into it and don't really question it and don't, we kind of resort to books and all sorts of reading uh, when the shit's really hit the fan. <laughs> you know, and it might be helpful to kind of get ahead of, of that and question it and reflect on it instead of uh, trying to catch up, trying to catch up when things are hard already. Yeah, it's like um, what I was saying in the introduction about conscious uncoupling. Um, just for fun, I, I looked at Amazon and after scrolling through 50 titles, I decided to stop scrolling because I was getting irritated and bored. 
there's all these books about it. And then, I, like I was saying, somewhat facetiously, because of them, you, well, I always forget that we're trying to sell your books. So I should ask you at some point <laughs> to tell us a little bit about your book. But um, you consider, I mean, would you actually consider using the term conscious uncoupling if you go ahead and describe what you did? I think yes, which is surprising because yeah. I think you know, obviously I actually looked back when I was revising the book, I looked back to that term because of course we all remember when it came out and we were all like, oh, for God's sake, just call it what it is, just call it divorce, right? That was the big reaction. I think what's really interesting is that Gwyneth Paltrow did not come up with that term. Um, I cannot remember the name of the, the person who came up with it. So she was actually talking about someone else's work and at the time, and of course I work in the, in the brand world. So, so my, and I work on naming a lot. And my first reaction was, oh, brother, you know, just like, like anyone needs a celebrity rebranding divorce, you know, is really what came across. I think that's what a lot of people reacted to, but now going through the experience I've gone through, it's like, oh, that's why, because not only is it a different experience, but the word divorce has so much baggage and it is seen so negatively that you really cannot separate the word and you can't make it encompass doing things differently. So for background in terms of the book, my husband and I announced that we were separating almost three years ago now, but we still live together. We still live together with our teenage children. We are not divorced. This was pitched as a divorce book. Uh, and I eventually had to to the, the original table of contents was before divorce, divorce, and after divorce. And then it, as you know, from reading it, the, the table of contents changed a lot in general, but then divorce is now in quotes <laughs> because we are, we are still not divorced. I know it's funny because I was thinking because you decided to get to the divorced, your relationship became really good. <laughs> it and did, also- it did. And I, I think, what happens a lot is, for example, the way we relate to our friends, we would never, we would never talk to our friends the way we would talk to our partners most of the time. You know, I mean, you really, when you have that intimate relationship and that day in day out relationship, you, we take a lot for granted. We think we can talk in a certain way, not say please and thank you. <laughs> you know, these really basic like kindergarten level rules that we learn if we did that with friends, we wouldn't have that many friends. And so in making this decision, we, we got that sort of buffer back because it's like, if we're gonna live in the same house and we're gonna parent our children and we're gonna be grownups about it, then we have to get back to appreciating each other and appreciating what we're good at. And we're good at partnering. We're good at parenting these children. We're good at running a household together. <laughs> we're not good at being married, you know, uh, we, we were, but we just aren't anymore. So I think that that is really, that was the key in sort of having that more polite buffer between us and really appreciating what we each do well. You give a lot of good lists. And one of them that I remember very clearly because I had both the good and bad side of it was the conspiratorial stuff. Like <laughs> when you're at a party and you both look at each other and it's a glance, And you both know, okay, we're leaving. Yeah, it's time to go. Yeah, and that's so cool. But what happened in mine, and I'm assuming my this second ex-wife will not listen to this because I doubt very seriously whether she listens to me talking anymore, (laughs) um, is I would see at parties where she, I don't know what happened, but she would be talking to people and they wouldn't understand what she was saying because she knew in her head what she meant but it didn't come out that way. So they turn and look at me like going, what, what is, <laughs> right. and that, that was the opposite of that. You know, we didn't, that was, that was, I guess that was one of the, that was starting one of that. Yeah, but, I think, I think there's also that, I do think there are those moments because even though that list is a, is a humorous list, of course it's, it's uh, based in what our day-to-day reality is. And when things are going well and when you're in sync, there's nothing like, like you said, you know, you're at a party, you kind of glance, it's like, all right, we're, we're done with this. But at the same time, you can be at a party and not ever look at each other. 
or not have those moments where you feel like you're in it together and it becomes this moment that is so much bigger than that moment. It becomes this sort of signal in, in public of how things aren't working out that only you notice. No one else, if you asked anyone else at that party, if they noticed that, they wouldn't have noticed it. But, but you notice it because you do remember being in sync with the other person and it being very, very easy. Yeah, and there's two ways you can drive home. You can drive home where she's saying, I can't believe you were flirting with her. And then you can go home and fight and then you can have makeup sex and then you can go to bed. Or you cannot say anything on right. the way home. And it's two completely different things. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's like, um, oh, page, what was it? Page 213. I think I have this, well, yeah, I have, it's a, you know, it's the galley, but I think I have the same page numbers. Um, oh, the, so the things people say to you. Yeah. <laughs> the list, and I'm thinking, was there one that wasn't said to me? And there may be one or two, but definitely maybe you should pray about it, which is like when I really wanted to hit them in the face. But, <laughs> How are you really? That's a good one. It, the other one is, it's like when someone dies, somebody close to you has a son or a daughter or a husband or a father die and you go up to them and you go, is there anything I can do? And of course, you know, yes, there is. You can bring back my son. Right. But I don't want a casserole. You know, yeah. I, don't, I don't need a casserole. That's not something. But George Carlin says, yeah, come over to my house. I, might, I need my house painted. Just come over and paint the house. Yeah, that, that's actually the right sort of responses now. Yeah, and, but there are so many. Um, the One of the best is, can't you just buy a sports car instead? <laughs> so well, that I think part of it too is that there are so many assumptions about what that sort of news means. And I'm just as guilty of it. Anytime someone told me about their divorce, the first thing I said was, I'm so sorry. And I had the frowny face for other people. And, and of course, when the shoe's on the other foot, you just feel, it is, it is sort of like grief. Like when the shoe's on the other foot, you're like, you just feel outraged and you get very flipped out about some of the things people say. And it really just became funnier and funnier to me that shouldn't we say these things maybe at the beginning <laughs> instead of at the end of, and uh, instead of at the end of a marriage? Yeah, I mean, I think in my life, like six guys have come to me and say, I'm going to marry uh, Phyllis, who was one of them. And I, I said, no, don't do that. <laughs> and I think three of them have listened to me and have had happy lives. And the other three didn't listen to me and were miserable. But, <laughs> and, and then I had another friend who actually grabbed the sleeve of the groom as he was going down the aisle and said, do not do this. Oh, my God. That's like a movie moment. It, it was. <laughs> and he didn't listen either. And he had 10 years of hell. And then when they got <laughs> divorced, the wife told the kids that their father had died. Well, that is new. I have not heard that one yet. And he didn't speak to them for years. That would do it. <laughs> it <laughs> but the other, the most poignant part of the book for me, and you had it too, is about the one about punching your kids in the face right. is that moment when I went home and sat down with my then wife and my two kids who were 10 and seven was literally the saddest, the saddest day of my life. Yeah. And, and I, just, and just to be clear, it's metaphorical title. <laughs> sorry. Disclaimer. <laughs> disclaimer. I also had to make that disclaimer when I actually showed it to my kids to read oh yeah it's the other thing they your husband read it before yes. talk yes. about that a little bit because there were a couple things yeah so I've kind of been down this um crazy making path once before with my first book and didn't learn my lesson and now I'm doing this a second time and with this particular book it was different the first time because my kids were younger and it just it didn't quite make sense to run things by them, but it was also kind of nauseating that I didn't run things by them. And, um, and John read the book, the first book, and I basically acted as a proxy um, as, their, as their father. This time, of course, I mean, this is a complex situation. Don't get me wrong. We, 
will end up divorced at some point. We still live together and our kids still live with us. And there was no way I could write something public and not have him read it. He needed to read it. He's incredibly supportive. And I'm an, <laughs> I'm an anxious person. I just can't put something out there that I don't feel pretty confident in and or have had other people take a look at it. So he's he read it through, I would say maybe two times and then maybe a third time it was edits. You know, it wasn't like you don't need to read the whole thing through again. This is just how these certain pieces have changed. And then the kids just read through that one piece because that's really the only one that's really uh, featuring featuring them and at a very intimate moment in all of our lives, but especially their life. And they were older than like, how old were they when you sat, up, sat them down? This was just about three years ago. So they were 12 and 14. So, and, yeah. And they didn't see, I mean, you were surprised. The, the surprise comes through in the book that they didn't, you know, just break down in tears and they didn't respond the way you thought they would respond, which was I interesting to me. I don't think I had any grasp of how they were going to respond and also i think when you're a child of divorce you have that moment in your own memory which is horrible and helpful <laughs> you know what it's like to to be in that position you don't have to imagine it so that part's helpful but you can't anticipate what's going to happen and i think for a lot of people including me just thinking about that moment is enough to just stay married it's just it feels not worth it some you know if the marriage is is good enough then then why like why even live through that moment so there was just no way of anticipating how they would handle it and i think they just happen to be at an age again i think to be clear i think the fact that we said no one's moving out we're not going anywhere you're not leaving this house i'm not leaving this house i think really had a huge, huge impact for all of us, for them and for us, because it wasn't this huge disruption of people moving out and, and routines being disrupted. That all stayed really the same in, in most ways. Um, I'm just writing a note here, so I don't, don't forget it. Um, talk a little bit about, because this is one of the, th I think the one thing your husband said was, why didn't you tell me? And I think it's the Bumble, I think it's the Bumble stuff. Oh yeah, Tinder, yeah. And Tinder, which is hilarious, but. Yeah. And I can't believe you got sucked into it. It just right? doesn't seem like you. Yeah, well, that's what I thought. <laughs> well, you, might, you yeah. might as well tell the, tell the story. That's a good one. Oh boy, that's, that's a long, yeah, it is long a piece. Yeah, I might save that one for for readers. Okay, it's not like it's a spoiler, but you're right. It does. <laughs> it's it's a chunk. But I like because I did the same thing. And the funny thing about Tinder is, like you said, if you swipe wrong and then he's he's he or she's gone forever. Yeah, yeah, it's it's because we're so dumb. We're you know when you get older, it's like, well, wait a minute, what? How how does this thing work? I think that really is one of the worst things is wanting to you know as you get older never wanting to feel like you don't know how things work and always trying to stay on top of everything and it's one of those really <laughs> crystallizing moments when you realize this was not built with me in mind <laughs> and especially as a woman who's over 50 it's like this wasn't even remotely built with me in mind and so yeah i just felt that there were moment after moment after moment where it really made me question what on earth I was doing, but there wasn't any other better option. <laughs> so it's like, okay, I guess I'll quit. I'll, I'll still stick to this dumb thing and this dumb journey I've started on. Yeah, even if you're not going to talk about it, I would highly recommend that the last part of it is absolutely hilarious. <laughs> it's, it's wild. It's wild. Don't give it away. Don't give it I away. Won't, but I yeah. Won't. Yeah, it's wild. Yeah, I didn't think there were any spoilers, but I guess there kind of are. 
So yeah, I so saw like in your biography and you specifically put it on the back here, you say she will one day live alone again, swear to God. But now here it is three years. And so why are you saying that? Do you want to have, I mean, do you oh, want yeah. to? <laughs> oh yeah although i will say that that's only on the galley i had to keep reminding myself that your bio gets read before book events right and like something that you think is really a fun jokey joke when you write it you're going to hear it over and over and over again and so it's like okay let's let's revise the biography so i don't have to or the bio so i don't have to listen to that <laughs> every time i do an event well but i would yeah, i would have yeah. changed it but then when i looked on your website it was pretty much similar so i figured okay i'll just read this that's what she wants you to read yeah the oh no that's fine um but yeah i mean like i say in the book if we certainly if we didn't have kids we wouldn't be doing this arrangement of course like it, it really would not make sense it's uh we felt like it would work we felt like we were really good at partnering and parenting and and keeping our house running and so that's why we're doing what we're doing and our kids are teenagers too you know i think if they had been say three and five that would be a different story Correct. but yes i feel like i am on a eventual journey to living by myself again <laughs> as an only child i think that's actually just my natural form where do you think you'll move to? Like a condo or an apartment? Or will I, get a house? I, I can't even wrap my head around it because of this little thing called the pandemic. I'm not sure if you've heard of it. Um, it's pretty under the radar for most people right now. Uh, but Vermont is a great place to live during a pandemic. And a lot of people agree and have come and bought all the houses. So there, <laughs> there's nowhere to move here either. So yeah, I... I I've retained my mindset that I discovered last year, which is not to think too far ahead. It, it, it hasn't really uh, been helpful to think too far ahead the, these last 18 months. And it's not like one of those satirical things in divorce where you've drawn a yellow line down the middle of the house. Right, exactly, exactly. Yeah. We do have enough space to have distance from each other and have, you know, have communal space and but we each have our own space too which which we're very fortunate to have and that has helped a lot for sure how did you decide in the book that you were you know it's funny sometimes I looked at the book and I thought well maybe these are chapters are they chapters are they not chapters and then I'm thinking you know you're just sitting there thinking and you go you know what I should I should do this too and then like like the like the formal pieces if you will like the contract or like when you talk right. about um, in kind of an absurd way, hey, do you think this is a good idea? I meet someone, I fall in love with them madly, and then I do this, and then I do this, and then I do that. The thing about it is it's so accurate. And that's why I think some people who read the book will cringe because that's exactly what happened to them, right? Yeah, I, the way the book started, it really, the seed of it was, writing humor around marriage and divorce that's really i think my intent <laughs> where it started i don't think i expected it or planned for it to become such an intimate book even though i knew i would write essays and it wouldn't just be a strict you know just all humor and so as it took shape and was revised it really became about let's look at this bigger picture the first draft was very much about more present day, you know, let's say the last three to five years. It was a angrier book. It was, I think, a more defensive book. And when I stepped back and really looked way back, then I was able to also discover more opportunity for humor. So not just the personal essay part, but where is there humor in as we're growing up and, and creating our ideas around marriage, where is their opportunity to have humor around, you know, kind of this explosion around getting these engagement photos done? Like it certainly was something that we got done and it's just, it's everywhere. So I, I feel like that was the nice thing about expanding the scope was being able to see that all at all these different stages, there were a lot of things to poke fun at or, or even just examine conceptually, even if they weren't 
quote unquote humor pieces. They were conceptual pieces that weren't necessarily rooted in, you know, my personal story. Yeah, and a lot of the reason they're funny is because they're true, which is part of humor in the first place. Right, exactly. Speaking of which, so, so much of your life revolves around humor. Uh, and it just comes through everywhere in your website and the stuff you do for McSweeney's, it, even in your branding. So when did that start in your life? And do you think of it as, hey, I'm just happy-go-lucky and I want to be funny? Or do you think of it as a kind of a shield? How does it work with you? It's really, it's interesting because I only started writing humor about six years ago. Oh. So it's really recent that it's become this other professional path. Even before that with brand work, humor was not something I was really known for writing. I would write more emotional sort of work. But what's been interesting in working on these two books and working, you know, having pieces of McSweeney's and the New Yorker is really looking back at where, where that started, like where my smart ass tendency started. And they definitely started in high school. They, I have a lot of really funny friends who were, <laughs> it's ridiculous to me now when I look back at how funny my friends were. It's just normal for people to be funny. And I think also, you know, I used to watch Saturday Night Live with my dad and I, I just, it never registered as, as odd to me. And now when I look back, it's like, oh, that that's why like, I just love Jack Handy and I love Stephen Wright and I loved all these really conceptual, trippy writers. And so when I work on stuff like that, I, it really, it's just such a bridge across such a long time period where, you know, kind of in the middle of my life, I didn't do anything with it. And it's something I was really into as a kid and as a teenager. And now, you know, really only tapped back into when I was in my late forties. I figured you were like the class, the class clown and all that kind of stuff. No, yeah. not, not really. You know, maybe my, the competition was too fierce <laughs> in my particular class, but I wasn't, I was a pretty shy kid and as a teenager. And I think even as an adult, I can be really outgoing with people I know really well, but otherwise I, I can be pretty, uh, introverted, which I never really thought of myself as, as an introvert, but I think the more I've, you know, stayed at home where I've worked from home for, for 12 years. And then the pandemic, it's like, oh yeah, there might be something to that. Like I'm an extrovert in very specific circumstances and very social and, but otherwise it's, you know, head down by myself, happy to be a hermit. You know, I read this book. I interviewed this author, Susan Cain. She wrote this book called Quiet. That book is amazing. And one of the things that really struck me, and not this is where I go off and I'm talking about me instead of your book. So you can stop me if you want. <laughs> I just enjoy listening to myself talk so much. Um, but in that book, she talks about how if you're an introvert, when you have a negotiation session at a boardroom with three or four people, it's great for you because you're not talking. You're just listening yeah. to them blab and blab. You learn so much and your negotiating position becomes so much stronger. It when, I, when I read that book, and I think that book had been out for a few years by the time I happened to uh, find a copy. I was like, oh yeah, I've heard so much about this book. I should read this book and didn't have necessarily a big drive to read it. I didn't think of myself as an introvert. And when I read it, I think this happened to a lot of people. That's why it was such a huge success is when, when I read it, I absolutely saw myself in that book. I never thought of myself as an introvert at all. And I have worked in a lot of cultures. I mean, most career cultures reward extroverts, but advertising, design, brand, uh, absolutely rewards extroverts. It, it, it rewards the people who take up the most space and the most oxygen in, in the room. It rewards people who present outrageously and pull stunts. And I used to feel bad about that. I still probably feel pretty bad about that, that I'm not that person. And when I read that book, it's like, oh my God, everything makes sense. Every, my entire career makes more sense. It's not, those people are always held up as being the most talented. 
and they're just simply the most extroverted. I think we've all worked uh, or know people who are more introverted, who are incredible thinkers and emotionally attuned and <laughs> some of the most talented people, but they just don't, they really don't get the, uh, the support or the accolades that more extroverted yappy people do <laughs> in those kinds of environments. Yeah, and you can tell that I am and what happens is I lose things because of it because I'm not it's not that I'm a bad listener I'm a good listener but sometimes I get so carried away with myself that I realize not only am I showing too much of my hand right but at times I'm making a fool of myself right it's a and it's a balance I think that there's also something if I'm remembering correctly in that book that, that uh, there's also a range yeah. So I think that there has been this drive to be like, well, you're just an extrovert or an introvert. And that and that resurfaced during the pandemic. You know, this is pandemic is perfect for introverts and it's it's killing extroverts and uh not literally. Um but really we're most of us are somewhere in that range. And yeah, that, that book's incredible. And she does talk about extroverted introverts. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's when I was like, okay, all right, maybe I've been really sh kind of shunning this introvert label because it it is a negative label, at least in, in sort of American culture, it's very much not, it's not seen as something positive. It's positive to be an extrovert, it's positive because it's an, we're an attention driven culture. <laughs> We're supposed to love attention and it's a very push pull obviously writers i mean come on like you you have people work in a solitary way on their books and then like throw them out on the circuit to do like you know the tap dance and, and top hat selling a book it's the craziest mix of styles and expectations it's just wild to me yeah it's funny because talking about that in one context the other chapter is headed, you may ask yourself, how did I get here? You know, the Dave, so you were channeling David Byrne. Yeah. Who I'm seeing next week in New York, by the way. Um, we were born the same day, the same <laughs> age as me, exactly. Um, but anyway, yeah, so that pretty much capsulizes everything for both you and me. It's like, you may ask yourself, and then you think, wait a minute, how life happened to me? Well, these <laughs> right. I, you know, these decisions were not made by me. They were made, it's like sliding doors or something like that. I also think when we're young and in our twenties, we have a very inflated sense of how much control we have. And just like, you know, I do think there's kind of this American individualism, you know, that I just make whatever decisions I want and I'm steering my destiny. And one of the most interesting things about looking back about around my decisions it's like of course i mean i have free will in in these decisions i made about my life and i don't have any regrets about them at all but there's timing issues around a lot of this stuff like when everyone around you is getting married it seems like a great idea to get married and, and i wanted to get married there's you know i have no regrets about that but it, we kind of discount all these forces that send us on this path and a path that's approved of and a path that makes our lives easier. Actually, it's, it's, uh, you know, just ask any woman who has decided not to get married or not have children, how hard that path is not necessarily for them personally, but for how culture and socially just never leave them alone. And a man can never get married and never have children. And it, who cares? Like no one gives that guy any grief. So we we really underestimate how powerful those forces are. Yeah, it's like my mother saying, if men got pregnant, they could have an abortion till the last day of their pregnancy. Yeah, they could do it at a drive-through. <laughs> well, and but you also did say at the beginning, well, no, not the beginning, but you did say, had you met your husband at a different time, there's no way that you would have fallen for each other the way that you did. Yeah, we we agreed. We both agreed on that. You know, we used to say uh, the the way that insight happened 
was sort of flipping a narrative on its head. The narrative we had always had, we, we were always sort of joke about how different we, we were in college. You know, I was sort of dark and cynical and, you know, I was going to UCLA, but I might as well have been like a vampire in that culture and this blonde, like bikini wearing, studying culture. I was like dyed black hair and dark red lipstick and smoking cigarettes and going out drinking and stuff. And so like sarcastic and bitter. <laughs> And, you know, he, John, by contrast, is like just smiley, easygoing guy. At the time, his, he had hair down to his butt, skateboarded everywhere. You know, it's like there is no world in which these two people meet in college and are even friends, you know? So that became kind of our joke. Like it's, we, God, we met just at this perfect point where we were, we could see each other and we could fall in love and really just perfect. And the insight that got flipped on its head, it's, you know, we just felt like, oh, and that was the perfect point. And then that's your destiny, you know, for the rest of your life, because you met at that perfect point. And the way that got flipped on its head is like, oh, what if that was the only perfect point? instead of the perfect point that informs the rest of your life. It's like, maybe that was the only point we could have met when we would have fallen in love. And we both agreed on that. You know, if we had met now, we're, we're really different people. And I don't think we would, if we had never met each other up until now, I don't think we would have connected in that way. I just think age-wise, circumstances-wise, city-wise, phase of life-wise, we had just sort of met at that moment that happened to allow that relationship to work was there that soulmate moment where you thought you were like just made for each other and it had happened before and would happen again and all that kind of stuff the way we met and I think anyone who's met their partner through work will probably identify with this is that you meet when you meet people at work you're not necessarily like oh I'm now I'm going to fall in love with this person you just know them you know that I mean especially in your 20s you know them you hang out everyone goes out together like it's just it's such a social blob of people that kind of move around in a pack and I don't think it really was until he formally asked me out, you know, already at that point. I mean, it feels like a hundred years ago, but it wasn't already. It wasn't very much like people asked each other out on dates, you know, I mean, we just kind of all socialized together. So to be formally asked out on a date, I think really touched me in a way. Cause I was used to sort of like you hang out and you hook up with people and blah, whatever. So just being formally asked out the, those little moments of, him showing up on time for a date. Like these things are so, so basic. And I th think when you feel respected, just the, the, like, just those little things had made such a big difference that it allowed that relationship to take off. Just those niceties, just that care in those moments. It's funny, now that I think about it, you portray him to be, more of an introvert than you're now saying you you is he an introvert yeah I think so I think That's he's I think we're probably actually similar in that way like in we're very different people but I think we're similar in that we're probably introverts with extrovert tendencies just in just in different ways you know he's he's a really private person and uh happy to be on his own, but absolutely loves to socialize, loves to see his friends. So I think it's it's pretty similar in in uh, in a certain way. Yeah. You know who I didn't expect to see in this book was Joseph Campbell. <laughs> like, where the hell did he come from? I forgot the context now. What was it? I'm trying to remember the context now. I could go through it. I should. <laughs> That's the only good thing about doing this on a Kindle instead of this is because oh, yes. then I could have marked it. I shouldn't say that as a bookstore owner, but <laughs> yes, there is no advantage. Right, exactly. Do you take that back? But I don't know why. You're, I was thinking, what was I thinking when you, when you mentioned that? I was thinking something profound, like the hero with a thousand faces or something. Oh, the hero's journey. 
Um, yes, I, I mean, I completely went blank when you just said that. Uh, that's just, all right. Just that's so right. you know, you know, the, you know, the time frame between turning a book in and when it comes out. There were like three days before I started doing interviews. It's like, I should really look at my book again before I start talking it. about it. Yeah, I should, I should probably read that thing, see if I can remember what's in it. I remember I was interviewing Eric Larson one time and I said, yeah, tell us a little bit about what your book is about. <laughs> and he, he didn't say anything and we had to go off. And he goes, can you tell me what my book was about? <laughs> I have never identified more strongly with someone than I am in this moment right now, because I have. I've actually had that moment recently where it's like, oh, I really need to, uh, yeah, I need to get on top of this, really remember what I wrote. <laughs> it's like when you cram for an exam and you know yeah. everything, but it only lasts for 48 hours. Max. You know, you know everything and nothing at the same time. Right. Except this is different though, because this is your experience. Yes. It's not like you're writing. It's not, it's not fiction. And it's not really totally a memoir. What is it? Where do I put it in the bookstore? I know, right? Uh, well, where do I stick it? I think it, I mean, it is memoir. It is an essay collection is probably the most likely place. The first book, I always loved that the first book was put not in humor and not in essays or memoir. It was put in parenting. And it's like, I don't, like, I get it. But please, dear God, do not pick this book up for advice, you know, was my concern, because it would be like with the breastfeeding manuals and stuff. It's like, this is not advice. Well, that's, that's <laughs> what they're going to do with this. They're going to put it, that's what I realized. They're going to put it in the divorce and counseling and therapy thing. And you make so much fun of people who say, and then you talk about therapy in that way. That's, that's also a really interesting part of the book, too. That's because I was a therapy denier for most of my life. <laughs> I still am a little bit. I appreciate therapy, but I've also had not great experiences with it. I think mostly because, it, and I and I don't even want to say that I've had a ton of experience with therapy. Anyone who knows me would argue I should have more experiences with therapy. Let me put it that way. But I think when you enter therapy and in you're sort of in a desperate place. It's, and it maybe the therapist isn't right or whatever, then it becomes not a really great experience. Yeah. My, rule about, my rule about therapy is if you go to the first session and there's anything that you don't like about the therapist, don't ever go back to that therapist again. Yeah. It's like, I mean, it's like a job interview. It's not going to get better. Yeah. If yeah. you see, if you see some red flags, it's not like it magically is going to get better the more you experience it. Yeah, and like I said about me, I don't want the therapist to really say anything at all. <laughs> <laughs> and one time this one guy came in and he goes, I feel really bad today. The therapist, he goes, I hit a deer on the way to this appointment. And I say, I don't really give a shit if you hit a deer. And I don't, I'm not, in, I'm not here to listen to something that happened, anything that happened to you. I don't want to right. hear any of that. Yeah, not, not great. No. But that's, in, in your list of things, that's the first thing, it, well, it was for me, the first thing, have you guys been in therapy? Yeah. And we were, both times. Yeah, you know, what about that fault thing? You know, you talk about that, yeah. again, somewhat whimsically, but, but, but straightforwardly too, about, is it your fault? Is this your fault? Right. Do you think it's your fault? Do I think it's my fault? Yeah. Did you uh, at any time? No. I, if I think back, I'm, we're in such a different place now. So I, I sort of right. often have to sort of rewind to probably four or five years ago. I felt, I wouldn't say I felt it was my fault, but I felt guilty for setting it in motion, setting the separation in motion. And that was one of the more painful things and really what a lot of conversations have revolved around that women, if you, the sort of cultural narrative is if you're married to a good guy in a good enough marriage, what is your problem? Like, what do you have to complain about? 
as where men could be married to the best woman in the world and will still pull up stakes and no one's really going to question him. You know, there's really that imbalance of women should be grateful for anything good that they get. And I absolutely internalize that. I still internalize it. And that's, so it wasn't an issue of fault. I don't think it was ever really an issue of fault. It was an issue of feeling guilty. I also think that when you have kids involved, you spend your whole life trying to make sure they don't experience pain. So when you feel like you will be inflicting it in some way, it is the worst feeling in the world. There's, there's no way of, of getting around that truth. You just like, what is, what have I been doing this whole time? If I'm trying to protect them and then I'm the person who's going to hurt them. Yeah. It makes me want to cry now. Yes, exactly. It's, I mean, I can cry thinking of that day, like, and, and I'm, and I'm speaking from a moment of things being really good and, and us generally being like pretty, pretty happy people individually and as a family. And I still can think of it. I can think of the hand wringing leading up to it. I can think of the mental breakdowns leading up to it and still feel like vomiting. Honestly, it still makes me just nauseous just thinking about it because it's such a betrayal of what you signed up for as a parent. Yeah, it's, it's like, you gotta be kidding me that, that that I am going to do this after everything I know. Yeah, it's kind of, a. I mean, the whole concept of marriage, I never really understood it. And both times I got married was because it's an ultimatum. The way I think this is, I could either easily get canceled for this. I think all women, I think all women are crazy and all guys are assholes. (laughs) And, and And what I think happens with a guy is like, three or four years into a relationship, he's sitting on the couch watching a football game. He has those Fritos scoops and the Lipton French (laughs) onion dip. And he's just very comfortable. And then the woman comes in and says, I think we need to move this to a higher level. And he goes, well, see, I'm really comfortable here. Yeah. Okay. uh, Yeah. That's what happened to me. I think that there is, I mean, again, I'm, I'm very clear about people should not take advice from one person who's had exactly one marriage. <laughs> you know? Like we all have our own. I like the way you say ex- exactly. <laughs> yeah. Like it's, that's my, the, the scope of my focus group. And, um, but I do think it, it's, I sort of liken it to being pregnant and then like you, again, just this, this cuts out half the audience right here, but being pregnant and not knowing what to expect with parenting, you just cannot imagine what that road ahead is like. And it's sort of like having a wedding, like you have a wedding and the next day you're just married like everyone else. And so I think that there is such, such interest in having a big party and making it official and, but the rest of it, there's just no focus on what that actually means. There's no focus on how that's going to work when you have kids. And sure, you can't imagine it, but there's just, there's no focus or reflection throughout the entire process. Everyone just kind of goes along and then is sort of like, oh shit, like once once I get to a certain point, because you just don't, you don't know how you got there. You do not know how you got to where you are. Plus you made all those vows. You made promises that that you didn't keep. Yeah. Yeah. I used to crash weddings all the time. And I was, one time I was really drunk when I crashed this wedding. (laughs) And I, as I was leaving, I said to the groom, I said, good luck with your starter wife. (laughs) And I'm sure that went went over well. No, I almost, he almost, I mean, I'm 69 years old and he was like in his twenties. So yeah, I almost, (laughs) I I think I ran. (laughs) Yeah, that that was probably smart. (laughs) But yeah, the thing about, the vows is, is like I was saying at the outset, that's what my brother and I are like, kind of, we question that you get up there and you, and you make these very formal, moral, almost spiritual vows to each other mm-hmm. promises that I think as, even as you make them, you know, there's a good chance. I mean, you have that in your head, right? Yeah. Did yeah. You? 
I, I absolutely wanted to get married. I w I did not have cold feet. You know, I've had this conversation with so many friends about how, how did you feel on your wedding day? It's like, I was, I was excited. I, I had no doubts, but I also think, again, I think this speaks to age and sort of the culture around weddings and celebration, that sort of celebration, like all your friends are going to be there. All your family's going to, you're going to, you're going to get dressed up and look amazing. And I mean, who isn't, at the ceremony thinking like in about 35 minutes i am going to be able to hang out with all my friends like have a delicious drink and like dance and have the time of my life i mean there's you're already in the moment already sort of blowing past <laughs> like this huge moment to go have fun and then when that big rush goes away it's like any sort of big milestone that big rush goes away and it's like oh, now it really starts. Like the attention is gone. The big party is gone. And then now it's, now you're together. Now that, that's actually sort of where the vows start. You know, that day it's like, yeah, yeah, sure. I do. Yep. Let's, let's go. Yeah. It's funny because I don't know, maybe you even said this in the book or I'm just channeling, but funerals are similar. After the funeral, you go to this party and there's all this food and you were really weeping and crying and thinking of your best friend. And then you go to this little party where there's delicious food. and Oh, it's in the Harry, the Harry and Sally. Yeah, right. Yeah. 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 That was good, too. Yeah. <laughs> it's very true. It's once you see shrimp and cocktail sauce, it changes your whole <laughs> attitude towards death. You're like, all right, I guess we're doing this. <laughs> Well, all in all, it was a really good book, and I really think it's going to resonate with so many people, but I think it will also probably cause some divorces. Oh, great. <laughs> I mean, right? Don't you think? You can't say that. You can't. can't I can't say that. I hope, I, again, I think what's interesting for me personally, and having written it, was how it was pitched as a divorce book and really became a marriage book. And I don't think I really anticipated that at all, that it was really stepping back and examining marriage without being bitter about it. Because I think that's the other assumption. If you've written about divorce, then you're bitter, you have regrets, you don't want anyone else to get married ever again. <laughs> and that's not at all where I'm coming from at all. And I don't really mean this as a compliment, although I guess it is, but I think the reason why is because you're both good people. Don't you think? I mean, don't compliment yourself, but don't you think? Yeah, yeah. Please do not allow me to compliment myself right now. <laughs> but I think that's, I think book, that's launch, book launches are a great time to have low self-esteem. Well, just channel the introvert. <laughs> right. But, but don't you think it's true though? I think you're both I good hope so. and good parents. I hope so. I hope that's what comes through. Again, I, I understand people's hesitancy ar around this book. And, uh, you know, I mean, talk, speaking personally, you know, um, but I hope what comes through is the respect that we have for each other, this trying something that's non-traditional, which is hard. I mean, it, it's, it's been easy personally and hard publicly or socially. It's fascinating. It's, it's and it's not for everyone, but I think it's for a lot more people than they think. I it's incredible to me how little the divorce path is questioned. It's just not questioned. It's like, well, this is what we're doing. Someone's moving out, kids are going back and forth. I think people would be surprised what they can figure out and what they can do on their own if they gave themselves a chance and the credit because. They got married, you know, a lot of people have gotten married for a good reason. And just because that marriage didn't work out doesn't mean that it all has to be horrible. And I really hope that's what people take away from the book. I think that honest, to be serious about it, yes, I think that's what they will take away. It'll be interesting when next I see you, if you are interested in the slightest, to see whether you are living alone and also what your next book will be about. And 
Yeah, I hope I don't ever write about my life again. Please, please, make, please remind me of that when I'm back with another book about my life. <laughs> It'll be about your new husband. Oh God. <laughs> um, and also, when I come back, when you come back, see if you could either be out of the closet or fill the whole. Th- <laughs> you need to fill the whole thing. I know. Well, I'm going to save up from this Christmas so I can fill up this part of the closet. Yeah, it's a good look. I mean, but it's not. Complete. I made it. And there's a little, what is that little piece of cardboard it's, back there? It's, mono, it's monochromatic. You got to give me credit for that. These are clothespins. This is very high tech. <laughs> this is a very high tech sound booth um, that <laughs> is structured by my kids' trifolds from school projects. Um, egg, egg crate, foam, and uh, yeah, and very extremely yellow lighting. So I can't believe you're being so mean to me about my delightful recording studio. <laughs> I didn't even know they still made clothespins. <laughs> right, exactly. Th- thank you. <laughs> okay, I guess we've pretty much exhausted everything. <laughs> it was a pleasure meeting you and talking to you. Oh, it was great meeting you too. Thanks so much for having me on. You're welcome. We'll see you soon. Okay, <laughs> thanks. Right. Bye-bye.